Hello class, so today we're getting started with does the knowing mind shape the world? So basically we're looking at uh, Kantian epistemology. So we're continuing our study of epistemology and we're doing so by way of Immanuel Kant, looking at Manuel Valesquez's text uh, philosophy a text with readings so i'm having you start at page 327 uh, which is 350 of the pdf and i'm not sure the uh, last page here i didn't write it down here but i'll indicate that on d2l so now continuing uh, on our uh, epistemological journey, we're uh, encountering none other than Immanuel Kant again. So Immanuel Kant, remember, was born in 1724 and died in 1804. So we must never forget the context of Immanuel Kant as an enlightenment thinker during what is known as the age of reason, right? Yet. Doing this, we must recognize that Kant's epistemological work is a uh, critical re-evaluation of um, reason. Okay, so remember that the title of his uh, 1781 book, The Critique of Pure Reason, uh, to you and I, this reads as a criticism in which the way reason was understood or the way reason is understood philosophically until then. So indeed, it's a clarification of reason. So Kant's writing is as dense as any scientist of his time. Beyond his difficulty rests his uh, precision. So uh, recall that uh, Kant's deontology still should be held together with his epistemology. They're uh, both apart of the uh, Grand Enlightenment project of Kant's transcendental idealism. So we'll touch on the specifics of what is exactly meant by transcendental idealism just a little bit as an epistemological position. So uh, this is specific to Kant, yet extending into thinking of uh, German, his, his thinking extends into thinking on uh, German idealism with uh, precedents like uh, J.G. Uh, Fichte, uh, F.W.J. Schelling, uh, and culminating with G.W.F. Hegel. So uh, in terms of absolute Geist and absolute spirit. So, so Kant is not only an, an Enlightenment thinker, he's also a so-called German idealist, okay? So for the time being, we'll offer a, a brief definition of transcendental idealism as a confluence of empirical epistemology and rational epistemology, right? So yet what is yet we have to ask ourselves, what is Hume's challenge or what is Hume's place here, given that David Hume's uh, empirical epistemology um, is antecedent to uh, Kant by 40-something years, right? So, in other words, we have the uh, empirical epistemology of Hume as it is uh, inspiring uh, Kant's transcendental uh, in, uh, idealism in terms of uh, how we're understanding the place of uh, knowledge, right? So Kant was awoken uh, from his dogmatic slumbers when reading Hume's 1748 book, uh, An Inquiry Concerning, Concerning Human Understanding. So even though Kant agreed with Hume's epistemology, he didn't entirely agree with our way of acquiring knowledge of the world. So in other words, uh, this idea that of Hume's that our way of understanding the world is, is based entirely on sense impressions or sense, sense perception alone, right? So remember that with 
something like Newton's law, third law of motion, every action always must cause an equal and opposite reaction, um, we have to see this as a close follow-up on a way that cause and effect is understood, right? So in the way in which we have rational knowledge of cause and effect. So yet we need to key into the problem of rational necessity that Hume uh, uh, relegated to mere habit, right? So Newton's third law is rational uh, necessity with no exception, yet Hume, remember, denied the so-called necessary connection. So this is uh, problematized with Hume's uh, problem of induction, whereby we don't always have a guarantee that past events will always resemble future events, right? So Kant agreed, for instance, with uh, the idea of uh, geometric mathematics, whereby the shortest distance between any two points is a straight line, um, and also in the natural sciences, whereby we have the rational law that every event must have a cause, right? So, in other words, Kant agrees that we go beyond perception in order to rationally understand the principles or rules uh, that these are. So in other words, the shortest distance between any two points is a straight line is a rational rule, right? And we go beyond perception in order to understand what these rules are. So that idea of going beyond perception is transparent transcendental. And so the idea that we're putting this together with our mind is then the idealism part of how it is that we're understanding transcendental idealism. So uh, we have to also think of these rules as a priori statements. So always remember that these are a priori. So you have to remember that students always forget that uh, when they first hear of this that there's an a at the beginning here. So a priori basically means known knowledge that we acquire prior to experience. So as Valesquez points out, this is uh, also a uh, way that we're understanding what is a synthetic a priori statement specifically for Kant. So remember that synthetic statements give us information about the world around us. An a priori statement is only reliant on our reasoning faculty. In other words, it's prior to knowledge. It relies on our reasoning faculty. Yet the uh, contribution of Kant's is this way in which we're understanding synthetic a priori statements, right? So, in other words, uh, an a priori statement is only reliant on our reasoning faculty, as with the statement, the shortest distance between any two points is a straight line. So, this is a priori, an a priori law known strictly by way of reason. So what's specific to Kant is what he called a synthetic a priori statement. And so a synthetic a priori statement is taking together what is a priori. So what is a priori is known prior to experience, whereas synthetic has to do with what is observed. So this is a contingent way in which we understand the world. And we might even think of this as known by perception. So in other words, a, a synthetic a priori statement is a confluence of empirical experience, i.e. known synthetically, and put together by way of our reasoning uh, in an a priori way that goes beyond sense experience to become what Kant refers to as the synthetic a priori statement. And I'm going to have, I'll have a chart for you to clarify how that all works um, so that it's clearer, okay? So 
when, um, so in other words, such terms account for ways in which we have empirical knowledge with ways in which we have analytic and a priori knowledge, right? So in other words, uh, this is a Kant's uh, synthetic a priori statement. So as Valesquez writes um, that, quote, for Kant, um, he noticed that something, something diff something both the empiricists and the rationalists missed. That is, it's true that the sensations stream from our senses, yet we do not experience a mere display of sensations streaming through us." Unquote. So perceptual experience is organized by reason, right? It uh, provides us, reason provides us with the law-like ways in which we account for the natural laws of science um, and our perceptual experience. So there's always a strong mathematical uh, and scientific epistemology in Kant's philosophy. So indeed he was um, critiquing pure reason in order to establish a basis for a better account for the rational foundations of math and science. Okay, so for example, we find corollaries in our knowledge of space and time. So for Kant, our understanding of space is usually thought of as outside of us, as exterior to thinking. Um, so for Kant, space is not a concept given that all occurrences of our understanding of space have the idea of space as prior to all considerations of um, measuring and identifying space. So our idea of space is always there in an a priori way before we conceptualize things in space to begin with, okay? So space is a priori and it is prior to concepts. Therefore, space is not a concept for Kant. So this is also akin to our rational aim of geometry and our way of rationally uh, delim del delineating um, space and measuring space perceptually. So um, also remember that the same thinking accords to Kant's understanding of time itself. So in other words, as with space, time is not a concept given that all ways in which we have knowledge of time always and necessarily have the idea of time preceding any concept of how we understand time to begin with. So perceptually and sensually, okay? So I think that stops us at uh, 3.33 of the reading. So I had you read from page uh, 327 of the text to page 331, okay? So that should take us to the end of how we're understanding Kant and we'll take it from there. Thank you.